Hey guys, it's Sandro here, and today's video is a pre-sale detail on this 12-year-old Pocket Rocket Fiat 500 above. This car actually belongs to one of my brothers who absolutely loves it. In his own words, it's the most fun car to drive he's ever owned, with go-kart light handling, a punchy, eager little engine that's economical, easy to drive and park around town, not to mention it's kind of a looker styling-wise. So it's with a heavy heart that he needs to part with it to make room for a new, more family-friendly car. We've all been there, that's just life. Now this bath has really low kilometers, no damage, the interior is almost like new, it's completely stock apart from an air intake upgrade and some decals, all of which are easily reversible, and its service history is flawless. However, in person, I've got to be honest that the paint and trims do look a little aged, weathered, swelled up and lack luster, compared to what is otherwise such a nice standout example of this car. So in essence, this is where a good pre-sale detail can get the paint and trims looking more in line with where this car sits in terms of its fantastic overall condition. And as a good brother, hopefully I can help restore this car's visual appeal that will also help command a better sales price that this amazing Fiat 500 Abarth deserves. So let's get to it. The first area to be tackled were the wheels. It's a little bit darker on this side of the yeah. too. All good. I started by giving them an initial pre-treatment using both tyre and wheel cleaners. The chemicals were allowed to dwell for a few minutes to start breaking and softening down the contamination, and that was followed by a good pressure rinse down. With the majority of the looser grime removed, that in most cases is what causes swirls and scratches, it was then time to give them a more intensive physical clean. I reapplied my chemicals and then used a variety of wheel brushes to give the entire area a great deep clean. And while I'm doing that, I just want to talk a little more about this job. There's lots of different levels of work you can pursue in every aspect of car detailing. It all comes down to time, cost, condition and goal. Pre-sale detail has a clear goal in mind which is to make this car more appealing to potential buyers and command a better price for the client. But this only works if the detail is effective in substantially improving the visual appeal of the vehicle and if it does come at a certain budget that allows for profit. Now, I'm obviously not charging my brother for this job, but I'm still taking it on as a job, meaning I have a plan that's going to balance time, cost, and outcome that's appropriate for a pre-sale detail on this specific vehicle. I've given myself about an hour to clean and seal the wheels, about an hour and a half to refresh the engine bay, and as the interior isn't too bad, about another hour and a half or so should be enough to clean it up nicely. The exterior paintwork and trims based on my inspection is where most of the work is needed. So I've given myself two to three hours to give the vehicle a deep stripped down decontamination clean and a further five to six hours to polish or correct the paint with an additional hour to dress, seal and protect all the paint, plastic and rubber trims. So about 15 hours and about $1,500 was my predicted time frame and price here. 
The price range of this bath is anywhere from $15,000 to $20,000 based on current market value and condition. So my hope would be that putting this time and money into it will place it at the higher end of that spectrum as it should look as good if not better than the competition once I'm done. But you guys can be the judge of that. So back to cleaning the wheels, I'd say that 90% of the dirt and grime was removed after this process, but I could still see some more stubborn, baked on contamination around the wheel edges and crevices that's most likely accumulated over several years. So I switched to a slightly more aggressive iron and tar remover, as well as a slightly more aggressive detail brush to try and remove it. Sometimes it is important to periodically use more aggressive cleaners and tools to remove fused on contamination as it can certainly start eating its way into the paint, even rusting and destroying it. But it's also important to only use these chemicals and tools as needed, as they can also over time degrade paint and trims if used constantly. In other words, it's all about finding that balance when it comes to detailing. Don't be afraid to use all the products and tools available to you but also be respectful towards them and don't overuse them if it's not necessary. With all that done, the last step was applying a touchless sealant to protect and enhance the finish. Each wheel did end up taking me a little longer than I had hoped, but I think it was a fantastic result, still in line with the budget. Next up was giving the engine bay a clean. It's true that today most car owners would struggle to even pop the bonnet or hood on their own car without a Google search, let alone even identify the simplest mechanical issues. But it's also true that during most car sales, the engine bay will be looked at. So having it in a clean, tidy and vibrant state certainly helps make the vehicle more appealing to potential buyers compared to looking at a dusty, greasy, faded mess of an engine bay. I started by using compressed air to blow off any looser dirt, dust and particles that was followed by masking any water sensitive areas such as exposed electrical terminals and connectors, the alternator and air intake. I then used a dilution of an all purpose cleaner to start breaking down and penetrating the surface contamination. After the chemical was allowed to dwell, I then followed up with my Tornador air cleaning tool to dislodge and blast the majority of the surface grime off the various engine bay trims and components. The fantastic thing about the Tornador is that it uses mostly strong compressed air to clean and very little liquid making it extremely safe yet incredibly effective for cleaning engine bays. Now this engine bay really wasn't all that bad compared to many I've cleaned, so the Tornador cleaning process alone was enough to get it nicely cleaned. But in some cases where the engine bay is extremely dirty, you may need to also clean some of the more grimy areas using a selection of brushes, and certain brushes will also allow you to clean into some areas that are otherwise difficult to reach. So 
So I also wanted to show you guys that if you don't have a tornador or an air compressor, a small selection of cleaning brushes with a good all-purpose cleaner will certainly also get you there. The next step was to rinse and flush all the lifted dirt and chemical residue off the engine bay. This is perhaps where the best advantage of the Tornador comes into play. I switched the Tornador's reservoir bottle to clean warm water and used just 100 or so mils of water to safely rinse the entire engine bay down. With the cleaning and rinsing process completed, I then used blown air with a microfiber cloth in one hand to dry and expel the majority of the standing water. The final step was turning the engine over and allowing it to run up to normal operating temperature to further dry and evaporate the remaining water and moisture. The engine bay will be further dressed and finished later on, but even as it stands right now, I think it was a fantastic result for a relatively quick and safe cleaning process. The next process was the exterior wash and decontamination. I started with a chemical pretreatment, applying a fallout remover over all the paint and trims and allowing it to dwell for five to 10 minutes to start softening and dissolving the surface contamination. I then used an alkaline strip car wash detergent in my foam cannon and applied it directly over the previous chemical, also allowing it to dwell for a further 5-10 to 10 minutes in an effort to strengthen this pre-wash treatment stage to make it as effective as possible.
good 15 minutes or so of allowing the fallout and alkaline cleaners to penetrate the dissolve and soften the exterior contamination. I then followed up with an extremely thorough pressure rinse down. In essence, this is all about trying to remove as much of the environmental and traffic film contamination as possible in a safe touchless manner in order to make the next physical cleaning stage both safer and more effective. Yeah, I'm, I'm ready. Rolling. It was then time for a good thorough hand wash. I learned to love the look. This time, I switched to an acid-leaning strip car wash soap that should be more capable at treating the many water spots and mineral deposits visible all over the paint and trims but should also be great at tackling more common dirt and grime as well. I used my main microfiber wash mitt for the top two thirds of the vehicle and my secondary wash mitt for the dirtier lower third panels. For many of the more intricate areas such as around car badges, grills and trims, I used a small detailing brush with a dilution of an all-purpose cleaner to help dislodge and clean the built-up dirt around those areas that are harder to adequately clean with larger wash mitts. I also made sure to pre-treat all the door jams with my all-purpose cleaner and give them a good pressure rinse down and flush out. On further inspection of the paint and trims, I could still feel some smaller and larger bonded particles that hadn't entirely been removed. So a claying process would still be needed to eliminate them. And I could also see some mold water sheeting and beading, meaning that there was still some lingering past waxes or sealants that needed to be further stripped off. I used an iron and traffic film stripping clay lubricant with a synthetic clay towel to both lift off the remaining fallout particles and further strip down any existing paint protection residue still in place.
Hopefully you guys can both hear and see in the footage that this chemical claim process removed both the bonded particles and stripped off the last of the remaining paint protection, which really is the ultimate goal here, meaning I'm trying to produce a result that leaves completely clean and bare paint that's ready for paint correction. The final stage was performing a quick towel dry to soak up the majority of the standing water, followed by using blown air to flush out all the trapped water in the panel seams and edges. Rolling, rolling, rolling. So let's get rolling here on the interior clean. As I mentioned earlier, the interior wasn't too bad. From what I could see, the main thing it needed was a really good dusting and wipe down to remove a layer of surface grime, revive the trims and get all the windows nicely clean and clear. I started by removing any personal items as well as all the covers and car mats which I cleaned outside of the vehicle. I then spent a bit of time giving the whole interior a top to bottom vacuum and dusting. The next step was using an interior quick detailer with some brushes, cleaning pads and cloths to both lift off a light layer of grime and enhance the finish of all the various trims and materials. The great thing about this interior quick detailer is that it can be used on almost any surface from plastics to leather and fabrics and even instrument screens. And you'll hopefully see by the end that it's not only very capable at performing some light cleaning duties, but also leaves a really nice factory matte finish with increased saturation and quite a pleasant fresh smell.
Give me another. I think for me, the interior glass was actually the area that needed the most attention, as it did have quite a noticeable greasy layer of film. But on the plus side, this also made it the most satisfying area to clean with the most noticeable improvement, restoring the glass back to a beautiful crystal clean clear finish. I'm also happy to report that I was able to stick to my time frame on the interior, getting it all completed within an hour and a half. And I think for that amount of time, it was a really nice refresh and overall improvement that should make the interior more appealing to potential buyers. Next up was a little pre-correction work starting with an IPA wipe down. I firstly used compressed air to remove any light dust and then used the dilution of isopropyl alcohol to remove any remaining chemical residue, water streaks or spots that are all normal after an intensive wash and decontamination process. Before starting any paint correction process, it's always important to measure the existing paint in order to try and gauge how much clear coat you have to work with. I've been playing around with the next paint thickness gauge over the last few weeks and I absolutely love all the features it provides through the app. It's extremely comprehensive and actually allows you to record and store readings on specific cars, panels and even take photos and document all that stuff just on another level. However, one thing I did notice straight out of the box is that mine seems to measure about 15 to 20% lower than the actual readings based on some quick comparisons and testing I did. Now I haven't gone as far as to try and recalibrate it, which should be a quick fix, but I just wanted to mention that as the readings in the footage are substantially lower than the true readings on this paint. With all that said, the true average rating I was getting on this paint was about 90 to 100 microns, which isn't awesome, but honestly fairly typical, and there were no signs of any irregular jumps, meaning it all seemed to be original factory paint with no warning signs or issues, which was great to see. With all the paint and trims clean and stripped back, this is the time we can truly assess the paint's condition. 
Now the most obvious defect is quite a consistent layer of wash and juice swirls covering all the paint and hiding beneath them, which is almost always the case, is some deeper random scratches that will require a bit more work to remove. I can also see a number of areas that have some chemical residue staining and although I was able to remove a significant amount of the water spots during the decontamination stage, there's still a good number of light water edgings remaining. But I think for me the most troubling defects are a few areas that look like someone has used a scotch bright pad to clean off some bird poo which is really unfortunate. Knowing my brother, I'm sure it wasn't him, but certainly the previous owner could have perhaps handled that a little better. Apart from that, there's a decent amount of haze and oxidation dulling the finish that I know once removed will restore this paint back to a deep black finish that I'm really excited to see. The final pre-correction stage was masking a few of the plastic and rubber trims to protect them during the polishing stage. My objective with every paint correction process is always to remove as little paint or clear coat as possible while still producing a great result. Every paint and its defects are unique and there's a world of difference in correcting soft versus hard paints and minor defects versus significant ones. So initial testing is vital to see what the specific paint responds best to and what's going to be the most respectful, successful and appropriate way forward. What I discovered about this paint during my testing was that it was a little on the soft and sensitive side and the existing defects were also reasonably severe. This meant that although using medium to light cutting compounds and pads was removing a good amount of the defects rather easily, it was also producing significant haze and marring in the finish. While using very light polishes and pads was producing a great glossy finish but just not removing enough of the defects. So as much as I tried to find a single stage polishing combination, which time-wise would be ideal, the paint and its defects just wasn't gonna give me a good balance of cut and finish in a one-step correction process that I was happy with. In the end, I found that a light cutting compound with a one-step or medium microfiber pad was the bare minimum of cut required to remove most of the existing defects on this paint and then a finer polish with a foam finishing pad was required to restore gloss and brilliance back to the paint in a two-stage correction process. So I want to demonstrate here both my working method and then show you guys the difference between a one-step and two-step process on this paint and the results.
Now method wise for the first cutting stage, I tend to use my larger machines and pads for the open flat areas of the car panels. And then you'll see me use my smaller machines for the edge work and body lines of each panel section. This allows for quicker and more efficient correction on the large flat areas and then allows for a safer and more effective correction around the edges and more sensitive areas. Microfiber is an extremely efficient pad material to polish with, but it does generate a lot of heat which is undesirable. So I tend to use less pressure and shorter polishing cycles with microfiber pads to manage that excess heat. For the second or final polishing stage, I don't tend to use a combination of different size machines and pads because refining paint is far quicker and safer than cutting it back. I also tend to use far less product on my pads and also tend to work slightly larger areas because this tends to reduce aggression and finishing paint is all about being more gentle and using a light handed approach to render the best results. There's obviously more to it, so I'll try and add a link here to my guide on restoring car paint if you're interested in finding out more about paint correction methods and techniques. So let's have a better look at the results. We can see all the swirls, scratches and etchings in the untouched paint. And once we have a look at the single cutting stage, you'll hopefully see that the majority of the existing defects have been removed, but you'll also see quite a bit of obvious compounding haze and marring in the finish. And in the final two-stage process, we've removed both the existing defects and the compounding haze to restore as much gloss and clarity back into the finish. So I hope this helps demonstrate what is being achieved and how I went about it in this job.
During a paint correction process, glass can sometimes be an area that's overlooked. Now removing things like deep, obvious scratches on glass isn't something I pursue, as it's just unrealistic and so time consuming to undertake, because glass is just an insanely hard material. But just giving the glass a nice polish with the same compounds and pads you're using on the paint to clean off any water spots, tiny micro scratches, and just restore a nice crystal clear finish does so much to elevate the whole appearance of the car at the end. So all the car's exterior glass was also given a nice polish to restore its reflective quality. Now, you may remember earlier on how I said that I allocated about five to six hours for the paint correction process. Well, that kind of all went out the window, primarily because I wasn't happy with any single stage combination I tried, but also because once I started getting down to all the intricate areas like the headlights, taillights, bumpers and trims, there was just more work to be done to get them to a reasonable state than I had anticipated. This is the hard part of professional detailing, accurately quoting and delivering a great result to your clients while not going broke in the process. So I just want to be honest here that although this job was by no means a high in pursuit or result, as I could have easily spent way more time if that was the goal, the paint correction process did end up taking me about twice as long as my estimation, maybe around 10 hours in the end.
Next up was dressing, protecting and restoring the look of the plastic and rubber trims. I started by giving all the paint and trims an IPA wipe down to remove any polishing oils and get the vehicle ready for the final protection and enhancement stages. I used a water-based plastic and rubber protectant, thoroughly massaging it into all the trims and allowed it to sit for up to an hour before coming back and leveling it down to remove any excess high spots, as well as knocking back a little of the gloss to produce a nicer satin sheen factory finish. For me, this is one of the most rewarding steps during a detailing process. I just love seeing dull or slightly faded trims being revived back to a deep black like new finish. It just has such a dramatic impact that's just so uniquely satisfying to see. Last but certainly not least was applying a paint sealant to both further enhance and protect the beautiful black metallic paint. The liquid sealant was sparingly applied onto a foam applicator, spread over the paint section by section, allowed to quickly flash and then wipe down. This final sealing stage was really just the icing on the cake, giving the rich black paint a touch more saturation, gloss and noticeable slickness that should also provide some great lasting protection over the coming months.
So let's wrap up this video. No job is ever perfect and there's certainly a few deeper scratches, etchings, as well as some more refinement in the finish that could have been pursued even further. And on the flip side of that, I probably spent way too much time for what would be appropriate for a cost-effective pre-sale detail on this car. Every detailing job is a little tricky that way. But if I'm being honest, this was my brother's car and family is one of the most important gifts we can be blessed with. So there's an added layer of deep satisfaction in being able to do things for family or close friends without expecting anything in return that is really joyful and rewarding. As I'm nearing the end of editing this video, I also just got notified that this stunning little Abarth has now been sold. So I guess the detail may have helped in accelerating the sale, but in any case, I hope the new owner looks after it, drives it and just enjoys it with a smile on their face. I'll leave you with the final finished footage of this detail. And if you enjoyed this video and would like to say thanks and help support future content, you can do so by buying me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash ccad in which I'll have a link to in the description box or you can now hit the thanks button below the video and thank you everyone for the support so far.